So um, what I thought I would talk about today is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, bypass surgery. And um, the reason why I wanted to, um, why I like talking about this in general is because um, uh, it's really not just about bypass surgery. It's more about <clears throat> what, um, how we as neurosurgeons practice and um, how we can um, practice a little differently if we think about what we do in a different light. Um, and so that's really um, uh, what I'd like to stress upon you. Bypass is really a vehicle or a metaphor, uh, but really this is about um, finding ways for all of us to evolve our practices and to really uh, push ourselves so that we take ourselves and stretch ourselves to our limits. Um, so I'm gonna draw upon my case experience, which you can see here. Um, it's uh, now 23 years worth of uh, a lot of cases. Um, primarily focused on vascular uh, and skull base tumors. Um, these are the vascular cases. And, um, you know, I, I can feel pretty good about my um, accomplishments and my, my volume um, when I look at these numbers. But if you take a look carefully at this slide, what you see here is um, that the aneurysm curve is uh, nicely, steadily climbing over time. But if you look to the right, uh, and break down the trends year by year, what you see is that um, we've actually reached a peak in the aneurysm volume and we're on the decline. Uh, and that's a really kind of distressing um, insight for me because um, you know, I think all of us work hard to develop our reputations and develop our technical skills so that we can become better surgeons. And in theory, if we're successful, then we should be getting more patients and our practices should be thriving. And what this curve tells us is that um, uh, we um, can't really beat or fight these market forces that are out there. Uh, they're too overwhelming. And even if um, you do um, a lot of hard work and a lot of good surgery, um, there are forces on the endovascular side that are changing our practice dramatically. So um, when I saw this, you know, one of my um, reactions was to try to um, capture the things that I had learned about aneurysm surgery and put them down in a book. Um, uh, and that's one of the lessons I'd like to impress upon all of you is that um, the pen is mightier than the scalpel. Uh, what you do in the operating room helps one patient uh, at one time. Uh, but if you can um, take your experiences and put them together in uh, teachable lessons and things that will help many others uh, over time, uh, it's a much uh, mightier uh, thing. So um, I've tried to do that with my writings. Uh, these are uh, some of the books I've put together. Um, and I really want to um, focus on a couple things. The first is that, you know, the book on aneurysms was really a reaction to that curve. Um, the sense that um, uh, these cases were dwindling. And um, I wanted to get it all down on paper so that um, people in the next generation would understood, uh, would understand or uh, would learn what I learned. Um, and I always felt that um, we could do a better job in breaking down our uh, operations into these steps. Uh, I chose the metaphor of a dance because if you can take a complex uh, thing like a dance and break it down into these ordered steps, then uh, it would become uh, understandable to everybody and all could do it. Um, and we, we put together some beautiful artwork with Ken Probst, my uh, Illustrator, and you can see the uh, the dance steps and the Sylvian Fisher here, and getting the um, the section down to this middle cerebral artery aneurysm, really breaking down the different um, thoughts and ideas that go into safely exposing this aneurysm, getting proximal control, finding the different branches that come from it, and ultimately clipping. Um, but um, when I um, started thinking about uh, the, the giant aneurysms, the really complicated aneurysms, um, and looked at my series on these. Um, what I um, came to was that uh, maybe there's some line that we cross with a giant aneurysm where it no longer becomes just a simple aneurysm and it has to be treated um, differently. And uh, just to illustrate that point, I want to show you this case. This is a giant MCA aneurysm. You can see here, I clipped this with what I call a picket fence 
which is this stack of clips. But here on angi angiographic follow-up, you can see it recurred. It recurred right at the base where those tips of the clips reconstructed that bifurcation. So in this operation, what I do is I bring in a, saphenous, or a radial artery graft, I plug it into one trunk, swing the trunk over to the opposite side, and then revascularize that opposite trunk. So both of these trunks are revascularized with a single high flow graft in what I call a middle communicating artery. And that's um, what I did for this picket fence. So here, now, uh, when we look in the Sylvian fissure now, five years later, you can see all the scar tissue and the recurrence there. This is a view of the external carotid artery. So this shows you just the standard um, external carotid uh, proximal anastomosis for this radial artery graft. Here we are back in the Sylvian fissure, and this is the um, temporal artery coming out of the aneurysm. So this is the temporal trunk, and I'm going to sew here the radial artery graft into, <clears throat> into that uh, temporal artery. And it's just an enticide anastomosis. You can see nino suture, good flow in this IC green video angiogram. Uh, but here's where it gets interesting. This is now a clip on the outflow from the aneurysm. I'm cutting the trunk off of the aneurysm. And you can see that I'm repurposing that dead end stump as a donor. It's not typically something that we use as a donor, but if you think about it a little differently and swing it over here to the frontal trunk, here's the first uh, uh, suture line. You can see how it re-implants very nicely on the other side of this aneurysm. And now we've reconstructed that bifurcation completely. This is a view on the back side of the aneurysm just to show you lenticular strides. It's going to keep me from completely uh, trapping this aneurysm. It's just a distal occlusion. But now you see the radial artery graft. It vascularizes both of the uh, MCA trunks, and we've created this nice um, uh, middle cerebral circulation from the high flow graft. So what does that tell us? It's ba basically an example to say that when you get to giant aneurysms, they're a completely different entity. They're no longer just a simple small aneurysm that you can put a clip on, uh, but there's something that requires a completely different strategy, and that strategy is bypass. This is uh, my giant aneurysm series, uh, 235 cases, um, and um, if you look at the numbers of bypasses that I've done for those giant aneurysms, it's uh, 44 percent. So nearly half of these are treated with um, with the bypass. So that's why I think it's important. Um, this is not just um, some esoteric topic within uh, neurosurgery, but it's really, you know, if you're climbing that mountain to get to the pinnacle of the hardest cases that we do, I think you really have to uh, acquire the bypass skills. And that's why this is important, uh, at least as I see it. So um, I put together this book and um, one of the a couple things I wanted to do, but um, I wanted to um, develop a taxonomy for bypasses. I wanted to develop a system of symbols that um, could allow us to take ideas and translate them into constructs. And I also wanted to push these intracranial to intracranial techniques. And the metaphor that I chose was architecture. Um, uh, I lived in San Francisco for 20 years. This is um, a view from one of my morning runs um, in Kirby Cove. <clears throat> and when you get down to the beach, you can look across the, uh, the Golden Gate and see the skyline of San Francisco. And um, um, this bridge is a great metaphor because, um, you know, it's really meant to connect Marin County to the city. And um, if you look at some of the earlier designs of the bridge, they were these enormous trusses. They, they looked terrible. They were very unsightly. And the engineers decided that they wanted to instead make this a statement about um, their engineering abilities and a statement about aesthetics. And so they changed the design. Uh, at the time, this was the largest suspension bridge in the world. These uh, towers are 750 feet tall, uh, the tallest towers at the time. Uh, the span of that bridge is 1.7 miles across, and um, it's about 80,000 tons of steel that's suspended by those little cables, which you can barely see. And the point is, it's a very elegant um, construct. It looks, um, to, even to this day, it's uh, over 75 years old. Uh, it looks very modern, it looks very bold, uh, and looks very beautiful. 
if we look around the world and look at other architectural symbols, this is now the um, Freedom Tower in New York, uh, which has become a symbol for American resilience after a terrorist attack. If you look in Spain, uh, this is the uh, Basilica La Familia um, in uh, Barcelona, and it's Antoni Godí's masterpiece, which he um, used to um, change it up. He used these columns that were branched, that were like trees. He used the parabolic shapes rather than the circular shapes. And uh, when you look up at the nave from below, it's just this beautiful um, sight that you see here. Uh, if you look to Sydney, Australia, this is the um, Opera House, and you can see these um, uh, concrete shells that are uh, created and stacked and tipped upward. Uh, and it's built out on the water so that this opera house looks like a sailboat as it's um, heading off to sea. And uh, one of my favorites is Frank Geary, and this is his um, museum in Bilbao, Spain, uh, showing the use of these um, really abstract shapes and forms and the use of titanium metals that look like um, the scales of a fish as this um, fish swims up the river. Um, so the, the point is that um, each of these artists have chosen to make a statement with their work and not just build a structure or a shelter or a building. Uh, they've chosen to make a statement about um, art and about what they believe in. And, and th that's really how I see bypass. You know, we have an opportunity <clears throat> to uh, not just do the plumbing, but to make these statements about our profession, about our craft. Um, it's a way to um, <clears throat> be creative, express personality, um, to express our passion for our work. And, uh, you know, I think if you're going to uh, embrace this way of practicing, it really demands a lot from, from all of us as surgeons because we have to be perfect. Uh, let me talk about blueprints. This is a, a house, and obviously if you're going to create a, a, a con contemporary house or any house really, uh, you go from a vision, some idea in your mind, uh, you have to then translate it to um, uh, a set of blueprints, and then you have to communicate um, through those blueprints to your construction crew how to actually put up that house. And um, uh, here's an example of the completed house. And um, we didn't have that. We don't have that in bypass surgery. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was to create this um, language of symbols so that we can actually um, create blueprints. So this is what um, I put forth in the book. These are different symbols for um, the anastomosis. You can see here, this is an end-to-end -end anastomosis. A side-to-side -side is over here. These are various endocides, uh, different ways of representing aneurysm occlusion, different ways over here of representing uh, grafts and donor vessels. And over on the right, you can see the various wiring diagrams for the middle cerebral circulation, the anterior cerebral circulation, the basilar circulation, and the pica territory. And um, uh, what you can then do is you can uh, create these um, blueprints for the, the bypass that you have. So if you're trying to think of how you want to rebuild the circulation, these are the symbols you can use to sketch it out. Now, um, it's hard sometimes to actually um, do the drawings because, um, you know, that, that requires um, uh, a whole different set of tools. And so uh, another thing I was interested in doing was to create a code. Um, essentially taking um, over here on the right, you see this uh, sequence of alphanumerics, um, basically these addresses for the different segments of artery. And you can essentially put an address on every segment in the cerebral circulation. And um, when you use those addresses, you can then describe a very complicated bypass like this one with a code. Here's our code right here in the middle of your screen. It's this um, A1ACA uh, using an SVG, a saphenous vein graft, to the middle cerebral artery. And this is a double reimplantation technique. So you see the plus symbol here and the two M2s as our recipients. This code really tells you everything you need to know uh, about what you're seeing in this picture. You know exactly the, how the connections are made and what um, has been done. Here's our symbol. This is our blueprint up here. You can also express the, uh, the bypass through the blueprint. Um, and here's our angiogram. So if you were trying to understand that, this code would really help you decipher. 
Um, so that's the um, that's the the symbols and the codes. This is the taxonomy. Um, I have broken these bypasses down into seven, uh, starting with the traditional ECIC bypass as our first in our first generation bypass. That's the uh, STAMCA bypass. That's your occipital artery to pica bypass. All of the simple ones that most of us do fairly routinely. The second class or second generation is the ECIC interpositional graft. And these came around in the, in the late 60s with um, guys like Thor Sunt, um, who used the cervical carotid artery as a donor to increase the flow, but it did require longer grafts, uh, tunneling to bypass, and um, uh, you know, um, some compromises in terms of patency. These next four groups of bypasses here are all of the, uh, what I call the ICIC or intracranial intracranial bypasses. It's the reimplantations, the in situ side to side bypasses, the uh, reanastomoses, the uh, short jump grafts that go from an intracranial donor to an intracranial recipient. The seventh um, category down here at the bottom is the combination. So combination bypasses are when one bypass doesn't do it and you need multiple. And so um, it could be any of the above. It could be one ECIC and one in situ, or it could be two ECICs, a double barrel bypass, but it requires um, a multiple. And it could be two, it could be three, it could be however many is necessary. Uh, so those are the seven bypasses. Um, one of the ways that you can use the seven bypasses is first to really get a handle on where your aneurysm is located. If you look at the different types of middle cerebral artery aneurysms, it's important that we really clarify a pre-bifurcation versus a bifurcation versus some post-bifurcation bypass or, or excuse me, aneurysm. And then um, when you have the combination of seven bypasses here on the uh, vertical axis and the different aneurysm locations here on the horizontal axis, then you can kind of lay out your blueprints and decide or see all of the different bypass options that you have to choose from. And that can really help your thinking and your selection. You can also walk yourself down an algorithm. You can walk yourself from the top here, some complex MCA aneurysm, ask yourself a series of anatomical questions and lead yourself to your selection for the bypass. So uh, let me show you an example of that in action. Uh, this is a giant MCA aneurysm. Um, and for this one, our algorithm would say this is one that we need to um, revascularize completely by recreating the, the bifurcation. So we have to expose the two trunks that come out of the aneurysm. And that's what you're seeing here. This is the temporal trunk over here. This is the frontal trunk over here. The aneurysm is up at the top of your screen. And I'm going to use the A1 as a donor. So I'm going to do this without using the neck. I'm going to not use a tunnel. I'm going to just use the A1, which is a tremendous donor because it's really right there in the sylvian fissure. Uh, when you split the fissure, you come right to it. And it's a very vigorous donor because it sits right next to the carotid terminus. So the flow uh, is really um, substantial. Uh, this is a view just showing uh, trapping of that donor segment. And um, this is a, a very nice um, um, arteriotomy scissors that I like to use for these deep bypasses. This is the bypass, uh, the, the donor site going in. This is the, the two anchoring sutures that anchor the, um, in this case, a, uh, I believe it's a radial artery. No, this is a saphenous vein, sorry. Um, but this, you can see some of the stitch work here, sewing down in this deep, um, kind of uh, perichiasmatic uh, space uh, of the A1 anterocerebral artery. You can see a nice suture line there on the front wall. Uh, tying this down, we can flip the artery. This is a view into the lumen. And now uh, we're sewing the back wall. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. Pardon the, uh, the fast forward, but here. Now I've taken you to the aneurysm itself. The uh, saphenous vein graft is lying in the sylvian fissure. Uh, I'm making my arteriotomy here in the saphenous vein graft. And um, what I'll do here is in order to reimplant that frontal division, I'm going to do a side to side anastomosis. So this is um, uh, two arteriotomies in the mid portions of each of these, the, the vein graft and the trunk, 
and we can bring them together with this uh, Nino suture. And um, this will be a side-to-side -side, uh, reimplantation. And it's side-to-side -side because we need to keep the other end of this graft ready for the temporal division as our third anastomosis. So it's a combination bypass. This is now an in situ style um, side to side anastomosis. You can see I'm sewing intraluminally. And um, these arteries come together very nicely here to uh, create our donor and recipient relationship. I'm gonna jump ahead again here uh, as we complete the um, outer wall of that anastomosis. You can see it coming together. And um, this uh, finishes up very nicely. Here's our completed side to side anastomosis. You can see the end of the graph there. We can reapply the clips so that we immediately reperfuse that trunk. And now um, here's the end of the saphenous vein graft. Here's the temporal trunk as it comes out of the aneurysm. And here's our anchoring suture. You can see um, the, uh, the stitch work now running alongside the um, uh, inside of the vein graft and into that deep wall of the temporal artery. And this joins the vessels. I'm gonna just do a running continuous all the way around the horn here. So I transition to now um, from interluminal here, which you're seeing uh, as I tighten those sutures up. We're gonna transition now to an extraluminal suture line right here. And we continue that around the corner. And let me jump ahead again. Here now is the completed anastomosis. So now we've got an A1 donor, we've got an M2 reimplantation, we've got a second M2 reimplantation, and now we can use um, trapping clips to isolate <clears throat> this aneurysm. So the, <clears throat> the aneurysm is completely trapped. You can see the three clips in there. There's good flow in the bypass. You can see all of the MCA vessels lighting up. The aneurysm is completely dead. I'm gonna just go inside the aneurysm and suction decompress here. And um, as this aneurysm um, deflates, I'm gonna do a little clip readjustment to free up some lenticular strides, which you can see on this yellow 560 right here. These were initially trapped between the trapping clips, but I've released them. They now uh, perfuse nicely. And this now completes the bypass. This was that example that I showed you of the code of that um, blueprint that had both the blueprint and the code. There it is. Uh, you've seen now the case and you can see how the, the blueprints and the code really nicely express exactly what was done uh, in the surgery. So um, uh, let me move along and just talk about um, this idea of um, evolving your, evolving the bypass craft and in and, and, um, a greater uh, perspective, just sort of um, finding ways to evolve our practice of neurosurgery. I mean, the, the idea here is that um, you may not be out there doing complicated bypasses like I'm gonna show you here, but if you're a spine surgeon and you do things the same old way, but have a, a better idea to be more minimally invasive or um, to uh, develop a new device that's gonna change the way you fuse the spine or correct the deformity, th this is what I'm talking about. This is. Um, my challenge to you is to think of ways that you can look at your practice and um, evolve what you do uh, in ways that help all of neurosurgery. Um, so uh, let me talk about this. This is Ica Bypass. When I wrote seven bypasses, I really didn't pay any attention to Ica. You might have noticed that there wasn't a wiring diagram for the Ica territory. There wasn't, um, there weren't a lot of cases on Ica Bypasses, but I got to thinking if, if this, um, seven bypasses framework is valid, I should be able to apply it to uh, the ICA territory. And so what this illustration shows you is the seven different bypasses that, um, that I did subsequently that demonstrate all the different uh, types of the seven bypasses. I'll show you, um, I'll show you uh, an example or two. Uh, this is a ICA bypass and it was um, in an elderly lady that had um, Pontine compression, symptomatic pontine compression. And so th just through a simple retrosigmoid uh, exposure, uh, you can see Ica there sitting right alongside of the uh, seventh and eighth nerve bundle, which you see here. This is the aneurysm there. Now we're looking down lower 
at the vertebral artery. This is the V4 segment. You can see the rootlets of 12 draped over the top. And um, now what you're seeing here is pica, which is the vessel at the top of your screen, and ica, which is the one parallel right next to it. I was able to get those two to run uh, side by side in parallel. So this here um, is going to be an ica pica bypass. So pica becomes our donor, ica becomes our recipient, and our connection will be this side to side anastomosis. So um, here we go with the, uh, the suturing, the, uh, the handiwork. This is the anchoring stitch on one end. Here's the anchoring stitch on the opposite end. You see how I used a single clip on this end here to keep those arteries together. Um, and now um, we get our intraluminal suture line going. Uh, this is the suturing that brings those inside layers together. It's a running continuous stitch and we run it all the way to the other side. We tie it to the tail of that knot that's on the opposite side. And here's a view of the intraluminal suture line. As we um, round the corner here, we're now gonna bring the um, outer walls over the top and together. So this is now an, uh, an extra luminal suturing of the outer layers. And with that in place, you can see now um, Pica can donate blood flow to Ica, which gives us now the freedom to go to the Anders and do our trapping and uh, decompress decompression. So there's the bypass down here. Here now we've got a view of the aneurysm. This is Ica right here as it comes out of the aneurysm. You can see the sixth nerve draped over the shoulder of Ica. And I'm going to first do my um, distal trapping. So uh, that closes the aneurysm distally. Now I'm looking uh, medially. I'm almost at the midline here. I'm pushing the aneurysm down and I'm looking for the basilar trunk and here it is. And I'm right at the origin of Ica right here. And you're gonna see that there's just enough room there right here to apply our proximal trapping clip. So there's our proximal trapping clip. The aneurysm is now completely isolated. You can see that it's soft, it no longer pulsates. And now we can go inside and uh, we can do a CUSA thrombectomy. Here's our CUSA. These are nice because they break up the thrombus very quickly. And all of that mass effect that was symptomatically compressing her pons has now been relieved. Here's the overview. You can see the trapping of the aneurysm up here. You can see the bypass down here. And I'm gonna show you next an endocyanine green angiogram that'll show you this retrograde filling up this way to our clips so that Ica and all of the lateral cerebellum now fill from pica and uh, it's an Ica pica in reverse. And uh, this lady uh, did quite well um, and uh, a good result. Here's another example of a, uh, an Ica bypass that I'd never done before. Um, this was a um, mycotic aneurysm. You can see it here. Um, this is a lady with HIV AIDS. Um, she had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The aneurysm is distally located here on the lateral pontine segment of Ica. Uh, if you look over to the right, here's the 3D reconstruction here. You can see there's no neck to this. It's, it's um, pretty much circumferentially diseased. It needs to be uh, either excluded or um, uh, resected. And um, this is the, uh, the video just to show you what that pathology looks like. Um, um, our inflow artery is here, and I'm putting my temporary clip on that to uh, isolate it. We've got a distal clip there. And so I can now transect the pathology and remove that uh, aneurysm completely. And if, you, if you look at where we are, I'm in the axilla of the seventh and eighth nerve. Um, the uh, ninth and 10th nerve are right here. And as you look down, you can see the uh, sixth nerve uh, in the very depths of this thing. So I'm almost to the midline of the, um, of the ponds and um, uh, oops. And uh, here now uh, you can see the ends of the um, ICA have been brought together here. So this is an end-to-end -end reanastomosis. Very deep hole working between the cranial nerves. Uh, these are the clips coming off. 
You can see um, the artery has been reconstructed nicely. This is just a little fibrillar unit to um, get the uh, platelets to do their job. And now when we look at our endocyanine green, you can see the reconstructed ICA here looping underneath the seventh and eighth nerve. Here's our post-operative angiogram. That reconstruction is somewhere right in here. And uh, she, she did quite well with that. Um, so that's the ICA territory. Um, you can look at evolution at other territories. This was a paper from um, uh, many years ago uh, looking at 10 ACA bypasses. Uh, most of them, for them, were these A3 to A3 bypasses. And um, since that paper was published um, uh, in these subsequent four years, I more than doubled the amount of cases. And you can see all the new different variations of the bypass that uh, I did for that. And um, the insight to bypasses, they weren't just the your traditional A3, A3, which you see down here in the lower left. Um, they were these uh, unusual bypasses, A3 to closer marginal, closer marginal to closer marginal. Here's a double pica or pericolosal to pericolosal plus a closer marginal to closer marginal. And so a lot of different variations. These are just some pictures showing some of these different ways that you can do these anastomoses. The same is true with reimplantation. The ACAs run in parallel, so you can not only bring them together side to side, but you can also reimplant from left to right or from up to down. And so uh, here are different examples of how um, arteries have been taken off aneurysms and swung over to the opposite side. Um, these are some case examples just showing, you know, an, an aneurysm <clears throat> in the inner hemispheric fissure that was uh, transected and uh, swung over to the opposite side in this uh, reimplantation bypass over here. Um, I also have shown you on that uh, earlier video the usage of A1 as a donor site intracranially. This uh, has become a very nice way to replace the cervical carotid artery for a high flow donor vessel. And um, uh, I, I've already shown you that. The, the, um, the azagous bypass is yet another example in the inner hemispheric fissure of using a short interposition graft and using an intracranial to intracranial jump graft to do this double reimplantation technique. So when we stand back and look, um, in the upper left, these are the 10 cases in that earlier publication. And you can see the different um, blueprints for all of those. These are the uh, subsequent cases uh, and the blueprints for those. And tremendous variation. Um, I think really sky's the limit. It's just a matter of um, one's own creativity and one's own willingness to try uh, a different bypass. Now, I, I want to talk uh, a little bit about this concept of fourth generation bypass, because again, um, if we talk about evolution and talk about um, how we can think about our work a little differently and move it forward, <clears throat> fourth generation bypass would be a, an entirely different type of bypass. As I, I presented to you earlier, uh, the first, second, and third generation bypasses. Um, some would say that fourth generation bypass is really just flow diversion. That's why I put this picture here. Um, but if you think about that early video that I showed you, this case here, um, and if you think about that uh, reimplantation of the frontal division onto the saphenous vein graft, you can ask yourself, was that really a reimplantation? Because it was really more of a side to side in situ bypass um, because we did an interluminal suture line. We brought these vessels together side to side. So it really calls into question what this really was. And if you look at the other bypass, that was an end to side uh, reimplantation, but I sewed it from the inside. And um, that allowed me to shorten the graft. And um, th that was a different kind of technique than what we're used to seeing. So the fourth generation really is in um, recombining uh, these different techniques or these different constructs in unconventional ways. So for example, um, that, um, that uh, last bypass, the reimplantation of the end of the saphenous vein graft to the temporal trunk was what I would call a type 4A because it's your conventional end to side anastomosis, but um, it was done with the in situ technique or sewing interluminally. So it becomes its own unique 
way of uh, doing it. And you can see that in this picture right here. This is the in situ technique to create this end to side anastomosis. The type 4B is really doing things differently. So that's an example of using this side to side technique for reimplantations. Um, if you put it in a table, um, you can look at the uh, seven bypasses that we talked about, but within each of these categories, there are ways to create these fourth generation bypasses, either through the use of an in situ technique or some unconventional construct here, the four Bs, that allow you to reimplant or reanastomose or do these jump grafts in different or unusual ways. And um, I I'll show you. Um, I'll show you uh, some examples of that. Uh, this is um, this is a uh, pica aneurysm. Uh, what we're looking at here is a far lateral approach. Uh, this was a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient. Uh, this is our aneurysm here. And um, one way to do this would be to uh, just trap this, excise it, and do an end-to-end -end re anastomosis. But um, when I looked at the anatomy, there are a lot of these little perforators that are coming off of this bend in here. And I didn't want to move this artery uh, out of its position. So what I've done here is I've freed the proximal pica and I'm going to do my end-to-end -end reanastomosis, but I'm going to do it with this end-to-side technique. So this becomes a, um, an unusual way to reanastomose this artery, pica to pica. And so I've got a stump here proximally. I've got the uh, artery here distally, which I'm using uh, to make a longitudinal arteriotomy. And so this will be an end to side anastomosis between those two segments of the same artery. So this is um, our anchoring suture. You can see how that nicely brings these vessels together. And I think, um, let me jump ahead here. This will just uh, take you through some of the uh, stitch work here, running the suture lines. But at the end of the day, um, what you see here is now the proximal pica here has been re-implanted uh, re on the um, distal pica territory. And when we do our endocyanine green, you can see this re-anastomosis of the artery, but you'll also see how this artery here stays in situ. I can leave this part here where all these perforators are coming off of the uh, P3 segment and going to the medulla and I can uh, leave them and protect them. So this technique is a way to, um, uh, to protect those perforators and do things a little differently. Now let me show you um, some uh, examples of, um, uh, again, these type 4 uh, bypasses and in this case uh, I'm going to do um, a uh, double barrel bypass uh, for this very dolichoectatic MCA aneurysm. And what makes this a type 4 bypass is that, you know, if I just did a double barrel STA MCA bypass, that would be a, something that I think we're all familiar with. And you can see it here. But what I'll do next is I'll use these ends of the uh, middle cerebral trunks and I'll bring them together. So once I've trapped the aneurysm, I can cut them both free and I can create this middle communicating artery. And that middle communicating artery allows the bypasses to then distribute their flow uh, throughout the middle cerebral territory, depending on the demand. Um, it, uh, if you look at these tissues here, the, um, the trunks coming out of this aneurysm are enormous. And the STAs are a, uh, pretty diminutive. I mean, they're pretty standard in size, but relative to how large these recipients are, you can see the mismatch. Here's one, here's the other over here. They've both been uh, revascularized, but um, this next step is going to be to create um, this middle communicating connection. So first I have to trap the aneurysm. Now that the aneurysm is trapped, I can cut free the uh, temporal trunk. I can cut free this frontal trunk, and now I have two stumps that I can join together. You can see these enormous M2 segments. This is going to be um, a type 4A technique because you can see here this is an end-to-end -end anastomosis, but I'm sewing it intraluminally. Here we continue, uh, and you can see this is a type 4B 
bypass as well because it's a end-to-end -end anastomosis, but it's it's a reimplantation of these ends to one another. So it's an unusual way to do these reimplantations. So this is our middle communicating artery here. You can see the IC green, one bypass here, the other there, and the flow around the communicating artery allows this distribution uh, of flow to find its way. So um, I've shown you this case, I'll skip it, uh, I'll, and I'll just jump to this uh, case here. This is a, um, this is a, another commun little communicating uh, artery for yet another uh, bellifoetatic MC aneurysm. You can see uh, the aneurysm anatomy here. There's a trunk here and a trunk there. And what I'm gonna do for this, I'm gonna show you the use of the A1 over here as a donor site. So this becomes our donor. We're gonna put a short jump graph that goes from here over to the M2. And then uh, like what I just showed you with that double barrel bypass, I bring the ends together and I form that middle communicating artery. And that allows the bypass to then redistribute the flow. So here now we're um, in the sylvian fissure. I'm looking at the back underside of the aneurysm. Here's our anastomosis to the A1 segment. This completes our anastomosis. And then we can run the other end of the graph up to this M2 temporal division. There's the completed anastomosis. And so now we have our jump graft in place. And so in order to revascularize the other frontal side, we've got to free this trunk off of the aneurysm. As you can see here as it's being transected. And then we've got to do the same for the uh, frontal division. We've got to free that up. And then I'm going to bring these together in an end-to-end -end anastomosis. And what you'll see is that um, even though I've uh, dissected these arteries free, there's still a fair amount of tension. It takes a little bit of work to get these two stumps of the artery together. But you can see with a little gentle coaxing, they, uh, they'll come together. And here is the, um, that intraluminal suture technique, making this a type 4A and also a type 4B. You can see how we have to really carefully place each bite as we sew down that um, suture line. But here after uh, sewing both suture lines, you can see the end-to-end -end anastomosis here. John, you may please mute. Here's the jump cap here. Here's our anastomosis here, end to end. And um, you can see a uh, nice filling of the uh, MCA territory. So uh, this is basically um, another example showing the use of the A1 as our, um, as our donor site there. You can see an overview of that construct with our end-to-end -end here. And this is our angiogram uh, post-operatively. So um, those are the things I wanted to tell you. Um, it's really about, again, evolving the bypass craft. Um, I've shown you different examples of that. Um, this is a slide that just is a list of all of the crazy bypass ideas that I would love to try. Um, I haven't done many of these, most of these. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, the sky's the limit. I think um, the, all of us have different ways or different anatomy that we come across. And we, if we're creative and we are um, a little bit daring in what we're willing to try, uh, we can create these very elegant um, constructs. It does require uh, going to the anatomy lab, doing cadaver dissections. This is an illustration just to show you how, you know, when we were thinking about some of these bypasses, we would do studies to see, can the anterior temporal artery reach the A2 for this ATA A2 bypass? We have to test it out in the lab. We don't wanna get into the operating room and think we can do something and find that it doesn't work. Um, so um, these are all examples of uh, ways in which um, uh, we have to prepare. Um, I, uh, let's see, I have, I'll show you one more case. This is um, 
Um, just an example of a dream bypass. You know, I, I'd never done this before. Um, uh, this was an unusual case of a distal aneurysm here uh, and an, uh, a unique double origin of pica. So there is this extradural caudal branch and this intradural rostral branch. They uh, came together at this confluence and the aneurysm is just distal to that. And so uh, if you look over here to the right, we can repurpose one of those limbs as an intra intracranial jump wrap. So we can cut it free from the vertebral artery. We can reimplant it here on the distal pica, and then it serves as its own jump craft to reconstruct uh, the pica. So I'll show you that case. Oops. Uh, here's that case. You can see the anatomy. There's the aneurysm. Here's our animation showing, again, uh, this fusiform distal aneurysm, this double origin of pica here. We can um, isolate that um, proximal limb. We can free it up, swing it over to the distal pica and sew it in, and then we can trap the, uh, the aneurysm. So um, here we are interoperatively. Uh, these, this is one origin of pica. Here's the other. There's the confluence there at the bottom of your screen. And here's our aneurysm. If you look here, uh, there's clot over the aneurysm. Um, I thought maybe I could clip this, but you'll see that this is a true dissecting aneurysm. It just doesn't take the clip and it ruptures interoperatively. So we have to then trap it and escalate to the bypass. Um, here's a view just showing how that aneurysm is simply a hole in the artery. But now um, this is the proximal origin of uh, pica and I'm transecting it here. You can see how it flips nicely over to the distal pica. We can fish mouth the end of that artery. We can make a nice long arteriotomy in the distal pica. And this becomes um, an end to side reimplantation of one of those two origins of pica. So um, it's not what I would call a, a type four bypass, but it is what I would call a dream bypass because I'd never done it. No one's ever reported that in the literature. Uh, and it's an example of how we can come up with something unique um, just by um, uh, applying some of these principles that we've been talking about. So um, let me finish. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead here and show you uh, this slide. I showed this to you at the beginning. Um, this was, I think, a, a little bit disheartening to see that, uh, but I wanted to end on a more positive note. If you look at the graph for bypasses broken out year over year, you can see um, that the line looks a whole lot better. We're actually uh, on the upslope and, and increasing in our, our volume. And if you look over here too, um, we're not doing so bad with AVMs and cavernous malformations either. So um, I think um, there is a lot to be um, thankful for. It's an exciting uh, specialty that we're in. Um, you know, I think what this um, what bypass uh, sends as a message is that, you know, even with something as simple as just uh, suture and good instruments, um, you can be innovative, you can be creative. It doesn't require high tech. Uh, you can do these very eloquent, uh, elegant uh, arterial reconstructions and um, you can really um, uh, be creative and innovative. Uh, it does require a, a lot of work. I would uh, stress to all of the younger neurosurgeons that um, uh, it's about hands, head, and heart. You've got to work on your dexterity, uh, develop your technical skills. Um, you have to think through the strategies for these tough cases, use your creativity and judgment, uh, and also heart. You know, um, what I'm recommending that you do is to really stick your neck out. Um, these aren't the, the standard bypasses. Um, you may have um, complications. There may be uh, failures. Uh, it does take a lot of um, guts to, to really um, pursue this pathway. But, you know, um, when I think about the cases that I like the most to do and that um, get me excited, it's these cases. I, um, I really love them, and um, I think they really uh, challenge me as a surgeon, uh, both on the, uh, well, on all three of these, uh, technically with the hands, the head, and the heart. Um, you've got to think it through. You've got to execute, and um, when, it, when the going gets tough, you have to have the grit to make it through.
Uh, so uh, it's 8.45 uh, in Phoenix, and um, I think I've spoken for close to an hour. I wanted to save a little bit of time for some Q&A. So um, again, thank you, uh, Raja, for having me. I apologize for my uh, late start, but um, really, uh, it's, it's been a, a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lawton, for this incredible presentation. Uh, it was really amazing, the things that you can do with the bypasses. Uh, are you there, Professor? Hello? Hello? Are you there, Professor? Dr. Bin? Hi. Professor Bin, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please come. Okay, very nice presentation. Uh, Professor Lawton, are you there? We are looking for Professor Lawton. I think it's got disconnected, I think. So, disconnected? Yeah, it seems so. Yeah, I think so too. Oh, well, we can discuss. Uh, go ahead, uh, Raja. Yeah, Professor. Yeah, it was a pretty exciting lecture. Actually, we never uh, expected we could uh, achieve this kind of things in brain. And he's rightly written in the book. If you read the preface of the book, Seven Bypasses, he's the author of the trilogy of seven aneurysms, seven AVMs, and seven bypasses. In his preface, he has written how he achieved this uh, feat of from a novice to an expert how we started, and it is very nicely written. I recommend everyone to read that preface of the book, Seven Bypasses. Uh, we really think that he should come back and take some yeah. questions. Yeah, Professor Lawton is here. Professor Lawton, can you hear us? Yeah, I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we understood. Glad you're back. In the last slide that I always remember such a uh, landmark slides you showed in Mumbai that uh, in a war everyone is afraid but it is when you override your sense of duty that you really win. Uh, that was an excellent slide that you showed in the conclusion of the, your lecture in Mumbai. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. On behalf of Professor Yoko Kato, I sincerely thank you for accepting our invitation. Now we can have some Q and A's. Professor Bin, can you do you know Professor Bin is a, uh, I, I must be so familiar to you, Professor Lawton. Do you know Professor Zubin? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I uh, we met in uh, yes. San Francisco oh, yeah. eighteen years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Professor Lawton is a uh, he is a one who inspired me. Um, uh, to focus on the vascular uh, uh, surgeries. So after I came back to China, I focused on the vascular surgery. So uh, Professor Lawton, yeah, can you uh, ask some questions? Uh, 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 answer some questions? Yes, of course. Okay, I, I noticed that there's a lot of uh, plagues uh, uh, on the vessel wall. So, is this bother, uh, bother you to uh, make the decision uh, sometimes? And uh, uh, I noticed that in some uh, cases, uh, you made the bypass on the, <clears throat> uh, on, on the uh, place that there's no uh, plague. So what, uh, so do you have some experience in dealing with this plague sometimes? Maybe to some. Is there any cases mm -hmm. that you can do the uh, like uh, uh, induct me? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, the um, there there often is plaque on the um, on the artery. Um, it, it's it's um, usually on the recipient because the recipient you only have so many. Um, choices where you're going to put the graft. And if it's plaque on the donor, you can usually trim it away and get to some fresher, more normal appearing tissue. So um, 
I, I obviously try and avoid sewing into plaque, but sometimes, you know, you, you just have no choice. Um, you can't move the artery or you don't have extra tissue to um, allow it uh, to move any further. So um, the, my, my view on that is that the, as long as the intima is well taken care of and as long as your bites and the rest of the wall are good and strong, um, you can you can sew into plaque, but obviously um, it's not ideal. And um, there are other cases where the plaque is so severe that you have to do an endarterectomy. I, I have a great video of a V3 vertebral artery to ICA bypass. And when I went into the V3 segment, uh, which as you know, is just that short segment back in the suboccipital triangle, um, there was a big plaque. I had to do an endarterectomy first to clean it out and then sew in the graft. So you, you can do that in some large vessel bypasses, but uh, for the very small uh, intracranial vessels where there's just uh, little spots of plaque, it's, it's often very difficult to do an endarterectomy and not damage the, the wall to the point where it'll um, compromise patency. Okay, great, thank you. And I, I just wanna say that, um, you know, um, uh, Bin, Bin Zhu ha is, um, one of my heroes because I, I don't think there's another person in the world who's done or who does as many bypasses as he does in the course of a year and who will ever do as many. I, I view him as the, um, the uh, it would be the, um, who's the home run king now? It's the, um, <laughs> the Barry Bonds, the Barry Bonds of baseball. Bin Zhu is the Barry Bonds of bypass surgery that uh, I don't think anyone will be able to catch. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. You are my hero, you know. <laughs> when I uh, see you in uh, San Francisco, so I made my decision that uh, I I should do the vascular, I should do, uh, be a uh, vascular neurosurgeon. <laughs> so you are inspiring me, always. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Atul Goel is in the crowd. Professor Atul Goel, would you like to come in, Professor? Professor Atul Goel? Yes, please, Professor. Okay, he's unmuted. Dr. Goel, are you there? Perhaps he stepped away. Oh, yeah, we oh there you are. Him. Okay, welcome. Uh, Mike, it was a great, uh, you know, fantastic uh, uh, show. There is no question, but you know what? All this requires very concentrated hard work over a lifetime, work in the cadaver lab, working with dissection, working with mouse, working with rabbits. It is, it just, just does not come like that. You know, it is hard work and it is persistence and it is patience. And also it is talent, you see, after all you have to be, you know, you work hard, but you have no talent. So Mike, what you have shown is an amalgamation, a mixture of hard work, persistence, patience, opportunity, and result. And my absolute, you know, congratulations to you and to your team and my best wishes for continued hard work and showing fantastic, fantastic results. Mm -hmm. And also, as you showed, the artwork of neurosurgery. Nice to see you, Mike. Yeah, well, it's always great to see you. Um, I completely agree with your comments. Um, the, uh, th this is no uh, easy task. Um, but you know, Atul, as you know, um, you and I are the same because we love what we do. So all that hard work, all that persistence, all of that time spent, uh, practicing and working on cadavers. Um, uh, I think you and I have enjoyed it. Uh, I think all of the young neurosurgeons, they probably recognize how this is a real pleasure, a real privilege to be able to do it. So it has never felt like work. And um, you know, I, I, um, I think you, you're one of those who embodies this uh, idea of evolving the craft, being creative, thinking outside the box, um, exploring new ideas, writing them up, and convincing the rest of us that you're right. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Professor Goyle, for joining us. It's indeed an honor to have you with us today.
there, there is Vladimir Benes in the crowd. Professor Vladimir Benes, would you like to come in? Professor Benes. Vlad, wake up. Where, where, where'd he go? I think he may have stepped away. Uh, he may have stepped away, Roger. Yeah. Yep. Professor Krishna Prabhu is here from CMC Vellur. Would you like to come in, Professor Krishna Prabhu? Mm. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, We're Professor, not lucky today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Professor Ait, would you like to come in? Professor Ait? Is Ait here? Oh, Ait, are you here? Ait? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. here. Uh, I was Welcome. just listening to the lecture. And, yeah, as usual, excellent lecture. Just shows uh, how much heart breaks, uh, you know, uh, a, an excellent surgeon like him would have had to go through uh, to achieve this kind of result. So always when we see these kind of lectures, um, it's easy to assume that these results come as uh, these results come easy, but as uh, Professor Goyle pointed out, it is a result of a uh, lot of hours in the lab, a lot of hours in uh, OR, and a lot of heartbreaks. So that's one thing the young neurosurgeons would have to realize. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, I, yeah. I think um, if I can comment, um, uh, I, I show you. Um, a lot of my uh, trophy cases, <clears throat> and um, these are cases obviously I'm very happy to show and proud of. Um, but I think um, I'd be right. Um, it comes from um, a lot of uh, heartbreak and plenty of failures. Uh, those are what I call our ghosts. Uh, the ghosts always are with you. They sit on my shoulder. Um, they never leave me. They're the patients who um, uh, I'm responsible for their debilitation or their death, and um, we never forget those patients. Um, they serve as uh, constant reminders that um, we're imp imperfect, that our ego can get too big, or that our, uh, our hubris can be too strong, um, and uh, we, we can't be numb to that. I think it's really important that um, that, that message be also sent. Um, and, you know, um, it's funny, I, I saw your, your uh, text this morning. I was going to reply and then I went off for my bike ride and didn't get a chance. But, um, you know, it just made me appreciate how guys like you and really all of the 170 or so who are on here, um, we all love what we do. We're, we're sort of consumed. We're, we live this profession. We live and breathe this profession. It rarely uh, leaves our thoughts. And um, um, I think that's what's part of, uh, part of what makes um, us better surgeons is just um, enjoying being swept away by it. You know, it's a passion. It's like a romance. And uh, when you love it and you think about it all the time and you, you find things within it that um, uh, excite you or stimulate you or get you to um, be creative or expressive, I think it's, it's, um, it's more than a vocation. It's a real calling. And um, that's what makes it special for all of us. Thank you. Okay, Roger, you want to end it up? Pro Professor Mathuria, would you like to come in? Is Professor Mathuria here? Professor Kimura from Japan is here. Professor Kimura? Okay. Hello. Hello, yeah, I'm Professor, here. Yeah, Professor Mathuria is here. Please, Professor. See, I already expressed that it's a it's not only the technique, it's a great conceptualization, excellent studying of the angiogram and the aneurysm. Then try to conceptualize that how can you exclude the aneurysm and maintain the circulation by the, preferably by the intracranial vessels and then the bypasses. I could not listen to such a lecture of an excellent conceptualization of the, about the circulation and maintaining it after excluding a giant aneurysm. Superb, great innovator, my all praises for him. It was really educative for all the neurosurgeons around the world, 
particularly about Indian neurosurgeons, I really congratulate you and admire you and we feel a gratitude about it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Dr. Mathuria for that comments. Uh, there would be hardly any neurosurgeon left in the whole world who's not been touched by Professor Lawton's teachings and his thoughts. I, I had of... been to Barrows when Professor Robert Spadler was there. So I was there for two weeks. I have seen the department say, I think that he'll he'll bring the flag of Barrows up, up and up. That's what is my wishes. And uh, that's what is going to be a complete Thank and you. And my well, congratulations to Dr. Bin also. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, we, we um, uh, are so uh, happy to have visitors come. I'm glad you came uh, and spent two weeks with Dr. Spetzler. We continue that tradition of um, welcoming neurosurgeons from around the world and uh, opening our shop to show you what we do. And, uh, you know, even amidst the pandemic, um, we uh, are, are continuing to do that and uh, hope that others will follow your footsteps. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So nice. Thank you, so Professor. Nice. Uh, Dr. Liu, Liu, are you there? Liu is my co-host today for you on behalf of the ACNS Education Committee. Liu, are you there? Hello, Professor. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Hello, Professor. Yeah. Thanks for the great lecture. I, I just want to find out from Professor, based on your experience, uh, when you have a planning for bypasses, and how often does intraoperative finding change your plan? especially when you see perforators, because perforators are usually hardly seen in the pre-op planning. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, um, well, um, I would say that um, um, the, the interoperative um, findings affect the decision probably 100% um, uh, of the time. You know, like I, th there are some cases where you just know you're gonna need a bypass. And so, you know, you, you can kind of um, just go in expecting to, but, there are many cases, and I don't have a number for you, but it's a, it's a fairly large percentage where you go in thinking that you can clip an aneurysm and something happens. And um, the aneurysm ruptures, the tissue falls apart, uh, you lose a branch artery. Um, and, and in those situations, you have to quickly escalate to the bypass option. And um, it's so helpful to have thought about it in advance. So anytime I see an aneurysm that's not routine, I, I kind of in my mind, begin thinking and planning for the bypass. That way, um, we all have, have experienced this. When you get into a, a complicating situation and you have to like think on your feet and escalate from something routine to something extraordinary, there's a tremendous amount of inertia. And if you've already made that leap uh, in your mind and prepared for that, then it happens more uh, easily. And it, uh, in many of the cases, it has to happen. So I think it's a very, useful thing to um, always go into a complex aneurysm case with a bypass strategy um, because sometimes that will get you thinking about what you need to do to prepare the donor or to prep another site or to get a little extra exposure here or there. Um, and, and then finally, you know, um, that final decision is really an interoperative decision that's based on the perforators, the pathology and a whole host of things. Thank you, Dr. Professor. Professor Lawton's, in, in your own words, I would like you, to professor. tell when in your article of intraoperative ruptures, you wrote, every surgeon must envision disaster in all forms and he should have strategies to amend them intraoperatively. That is a uh, sentence quoted in almost all the series of aneurysm ruptures after you wrote that. <laughs> Indeed, that is a golden words from you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor glad Hido, to, glad to yeah. see you. It makes me happy to see you've been reading. It definitely, I'll read most of all your literatures. Thank you for educating us. And your co videos are fantastic and are again teaching us a lot of uh, new things. Uh, congratulations for those great co videos that you keep mm -hmm. on posting. Any words from Professor Hidohito Kimura, and we'll wind up. Professor Kimura from Japan, are you there? Hi, uh, I'm Hidohito Kimura, uh, Kobe University from Kobe, Japan. Thank you, uh, Professor Rotem and John and the Professor uh, Dr. 
larger. Uh, uh, thank you for asking me. So I'm so impressed with the uh, topic of uh, several bypasses for the treatment of a variety of difficult several vascular regions and the big, big giant aneurysm. So this is one question. So Professor Rotong, may I give you one question? So yes. even with your excellent bypass uh, techniques and great surgical strategies, and uh, the problem is that the perforating up branches of the coming out of the terminated artery may be occluded in the late, late surgical phase. So how can you solve that problem? Do you use some antiparated drug, drugs post-operatively to the patient or something yeah. like that? Maybe yeah. the problem. I think um, one of the most vexing problems that we still have is that um, we can do um, all of these beautiful bypasses and we can exclude the aneurysm. And um, if you, for example, on the basilar trunk have one perforator that occludes, you can end up um, with a patient that never wakes up. And um, it is uh, a terrible problem. Um, I haven't completely solved it. Um, I've written about this a lot for um, flow reversal, in particular for um, the basilar trunk aneurysms, where it's uh, really so devastating. Um, I, I do think that we can um, help that problem by being more aggressive with our antiplatelet regimen. Um, you know, for those patients that I do flow reversal where there are perforators at risk, I will use um, aspirin and Plavix no. fairly aggressively in the post-operative period. Um, you know, um, I, I tend to, um, well, I treat everybody that's been bypassed with aspirin, but um, for the um, for the basilar trunk aneurysms, I put them on Plavix the, you know, right, right after they wake up from surgery. And yeah. I think that that's, um, um, something that can be done. It's not, it's not um, fail uh, safe. You know, you still get problems and complications, but um, um, you know, it's one thing that you can do. And I, I don't know that there's a whole lot else that we can do because um, there are gonna be um, these large arteries that have perforators and stagnating flow and uh, they're just gonna be at risk. Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah thank you for your comments. So congratulations. So once again, thank you for your nice presentation. I love. I also love bypass surgery, so I will follow you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kimura. So thank in you. that note, we would uh, rather wind up for today. I, on behalf of the ACNS Education Committee and the president of ACNS, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to thank Professor Michael Lawton, who has accepted our invitation and gave us such a fabulous talk. Professor Zubin, uh, are you here, Professor Zubin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Raja? Professor Zubin, thank yeah, you yeah, yeah. so much for I, being I, here. I have a good news for, for you and the for Dr. Uh, Professor Lawton. Uh, today, we arranged the WeChat channel uh, broadcast. So there's uh, 1,300 audience in the WeChat channel. <laughs> great, great. Yeah. that's great. That's yeah. yeah, Professor Lawton has a huge fan following. I remember yes, he, yes. He, cra he crashed the internet mm -hmm. during Brazilian neurosurgery talk. He gave recently last month, around 4,000 viewers were there. And it was a great gesture. Well, that's him. great to hear. Well, thank you for, for that, uh, Ben Zhu. I appreciate the, uh, the numbers. I, I like following the numbers. Thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. You broke the record for neurosurgical TV also. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zubin, for holding the fort and, uh, for us until Professor Lawton arrived. We are sincerely thankful to you for that. Please express our deep uh, apologies for all those people who, are kept wait, uh, who kept waiting. And thank you. Thank you for all those, who, all those people who uh, waited for so long and supported our educational initiative of the ACNS. Uh, we hope you extend your support for us in the future also. Thank you, Professor Lawton. Uh, and uh, my regards to Diana More, who arranged this uh, talk. And we had a lot of communication between us. Please come with my regards to her. And uh, uh, continue our education and us in future too. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Raja. Congratulations uh, on a great uh, event. And John, thank you for televising. and. Um, 
Uh, ben Zhu, always great to see you. It was a great uh, event, and I would be um, delighted to join you in the future. So uh, please uh, uh, consider that an open invitation. Very good. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. right.